Turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 3. Um, people seem to enjoy question and answer, so um, I'll leave that to uh, the taste of some, some of the folks to see if we want to continue to do it. I don't mind doing it. I just want to make sure you're, uh, you're getting something out of it and we're just not doing, you know, stump the pastor, things like that. You know, get the, you know, try to get them next week, you know, because uh, that's not what we're trying to do. I, I definitely don't know. I, I can... I can bring you a lot of guys that know a lot more than I do, you know, then I, I, I hold, you know, I look like I'm holding a pacifier next to them, and, and they could answer better questions than I can, but at Ruth chapter 3, under the refuge of our Redeemer, under the refuge of our Redeemer, you'll see why we're going to be talking about the refuge in the Lord Jesus. Um, because of the time, we're not going to read the passage through it, we're going to read it as we go. So usually I read a large portion of the scripture and then we comment on it. So I'm going to comment it as we go. Of course, we're reading the book of Ruth as part of the five scrolls that are read every year. Ruth specifically, you heard me say this thousands of times already probably. When is Ruth read? What feast? Does anyone know? What's that? Pentecost, Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. By the way, uh, what book did they read at Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur, anybody know? It's not one of the fives, but the, it, is, it is a major feast. My wife was trying to teach that to my, my kids the other day. The book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Now, why? Well, we're going to study Jonah. Maybe next year, at this rate. But um, the story of Ruth is about a family, a people, a group, insignificant at the time of the judges. Anybody know what was going on at the time of the judges? What kind of a climate, I mean, a, a, a atmosphere, what kind of a spiritual climate did they live at the time? Normal, Pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody did what was right. Every, that's right. Everybody did what they thought was right. That was Israel. That was in the U.S. 2016. It was Israel. And they had no king. It says three times, consecutive chapters. Now, the interesting thing is, they never should have had a king at the time. They didn't have a king. God was their king. And God offered, them, offered himself as the king of Israel when he married Israel at the time of Mount Sinai. He not only married her, but he constituted himself, or he put himself as king over Israel, he gave him his law, he gave him his word, and Israel turned away from God. And, and in the book of um, Judges, we see that. And it was a time of terrible spiritual conditions. Everybody did what was in their own, uh, right in their own eyes. Levites, priests, people, murder, adultery. It was awful, even among, even among the spiritual people, uh, uh, God's people at the time. And of course, during this time, uh, there's a famine in Bethlehem. And uh, this is a way of review, but if somebody's watching it for the first time, it helps. Uh, there's a famine, and their family of Abimelech, Naomi, two sons, go from Bethlehem to Moab, because there's more food in Moab. And they go outside the promised land. And every time you go outside the promised land, it's not a good thing. Whenever you see Israel leaving the promised land, it's never good. Exiles, Abraham, remember that? No good. Uh, so when you leave the promised land, you're going away from God's blessings and God's protection and God's provision. And of course, her husband dies, her two boys died, but they had married two Moabite girls, Orpah and Ruth. And Naomi decides to come back, back to Bethlehem, back to the house of bread, because now the Lord has provided for his people. He has visited his people, uh, and now he's providing something, food. Remember, uh, famines in Israel never constituted to just bad weather. There's always a spiritual issue behind. God told them, when you get into the land, it's not going to be like Egypt, where you worked, you irrigated the land, and you got your fruits. In Israel, I'm going to give you the fruit. I'm going to send the rain, and I'm going to send you the blessings. But if you go again away from me, if you become an idolater, if you go away from my precepts, I'm not going to make the skies look like bronze, and I'm going to have to be no rain. And they didn't have rain. So she comes back with two daughters-in-law, no son, no husband. And she says, I am a bitter woman now. The Lord has dealt with me bitterly. 
In the process, Orpah goes back. She says, go back to your land, go back to your gods. And she does. And Ruth says, no, my people, I mean, uh, your people will be my people, but your God will be my God. She is aligning herself with the people of God. She's going back under the promise that God gave to Abraham. And which, by the way, the Moabites were related to Abraham through Lot, but the Moabites came out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. You see that in the book of Genesis, uh, when they escaped Sodom and Gomorrah, they thought it was the end of the world. And of course, Ruth, here's Ruth, and uh, she's aligning herself with God's people, and she's aligning herself with the God of Israel. She's gleaning because they're poor, they're destitute, and they're gleaning, and she happens to land, or she happens to be in the place of the fields of Boaz. Boaz means strong, and he is a pillar. And Boaz pays attention to her, and she recognizes her, and she praises her because she's been so kind to Naomi, her mother-in-law. Um, the god of Moab is what's, <clears throat> what's called Chemosh. Um, they called him later Molech, and this is a statue of Molech, and uh, he was a bloodthirsty, evil, vengeful, angry, wrathful god. And they worshipped him. And even Israel at the, uh, some time later worshipped Molech, and they offered uh, child sacrifices uh, in the name of Molech. And God was angry at them because of what they did. But this is what Ruth was worshipping at some point, her, uh, her ancestors. Uh, but now she is going to come under the refuge of God. She's going to turn away from that idolatry and come under the shadow of the Almighty. From darkness to light. Remember what God told Saul, known as Saul, who became Paul? He says, Saul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of the devil to the power of God, so they would have salvation, so they would have the forgiveness of sin. And that was was offered to Saul. Saul became uh, a believer. Saul was turned from darkness to light. So that is offered to all of people throughout the New Testament and Old Testament. And um, because God wants his people to know him, even from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, he created us to know him. And, and he wants to offer us forgiveness and mercy. Even from the very beginning, he provided something for Adam and Eve after they sinned. And uh, of course, we know the story. And this is where he picks off. In chapter 3, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? It is not Boaz, our kinsman, the word kinsman, redeemer. Uh, Goel is the word, Goel. Whose maids were you? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, and therefore anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to that man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lays down that you'll notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you shall do. So they have this conversation. After gleaning in the field, she comes back with a lot of food, a lot of barley, a lot of uh, gleaning from the fields. And Naomi says, where have you been? I said, oh, we just happened to be in the fields of Boaz. And she begins to get excited. Because she knows the word of God. You know those passages in Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25 that I told you last week you should read? Uh, those important passages that all of us know and read about it every day? Those are important. The word of God, right? She knew them. And she began to think, Boaz, a relative. Hmm. A widow. And no money and no land. Her, her, uh, her dead husband, Abimelech, was a relative of Boaz. And according to the law, according to Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25, maybe I'll, I'll read Deuteronomy because it's a very, very funny, strange law about Leverite marriage. Leverite marriage. And what that is is simply, as I, as I shared with you before, it gave the opportunity for the dead husband that had no children, no offsprings, for his name to continue because his, uh, his brother could actually marry his wife, who's a widow now, and they could have a child, and that child will be named after the deceased husband. And they will be named after him. It will be technically a descendant of the, the, the dead relative. Biologically, though, it was, had his, a different dad. 
but nonetheless, it was still within the family. And that Leverite marriage allowed them to redeem the land, which can never be lost. They can, they can sell the use of it, but they can never lose it because it's my land, God says. But the usage, they could sell it. And if they were poor, they, uh, they could buy it back. But if they were poor, they couldn't buy it back. So they would need a kinsman redeemer, a relative who was able to legally do it, but also had the grace to do it. So it was an act of kindness. He didn't have to do it. In fact, uh, let's go there. Just Deuteronomy 25. Let's go there so you don't think that... Uh, um, I know he talks about the law, but where is it? Deuteronomy 25. Uh, and if you want a little bit further reading, Leviticus 25 does the same thing. But this one goes a little more deeper. Verse 5. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. Now, it's sort of comical when you read it, but it's, it's the very word of God. Uh, it's strange to us because we live in the West. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall, be, shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a husband, uh, husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn who, uh, whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. God always wanted the identity of the tribes to continue. That's why in many, in many ways we still have them. Many people in Israel still know where their lineage from. Even at the time of Jesus, they knew where they were from. Uh, we knew that, uh, um, um, what was the name of that prophetess? Anna was from the tribe of Ishakar. How did they, keep, they kept track of the lines. And so a lot of these uh, genealogies and numbers and chronicles are very important for that reason. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, remember, it's legally, yes, but he can turn it down. doesn't have to. Then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he insists and he says, I do not desire to take her. Maybe he didn't want her. Maybe he didn't like her. Maybe he didn't want to be with his uh, you know, sister-in-law. I can't stand her. You know, can't believe my brother married her. Something like that. And uh, if that was the case, then he could say no. And um, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandals off his foot, spit in his face, and she shall declare, does it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And in Israel his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. Pretty comical, pretty funny. Spit in his face, take off his shoe, and he'll be known as the guy who had no shoe. How's that be his name? Because he didn't want to redeem it. So it takes both a legal aspect, he had to qualify as a relative, close relative, but he also had to do it. He also had to, I'm sorry, he also had the, uh, had the kindness to do it. And this is where Boaz's situation comes in. Naomi sees the kindness Boaz shows to Ruth. He's given her a place to glean. He's given her lots of food to come back with. And he notices that this is what this man is showing kindness to, his, uh, to, to Ruth. And he says, look, this is what you got to do. There's this law in Israel. Remember, Mo, uh, uh, she's a Moabite. She doesn't know the rules of it. She doesn't know the law of God. She doesn't, she's starting to know the word of God. And she explains to her, this is the Leverite marriage. And you can go to him. He's a, he's a near kin. Now, whether Naomi knew that this was, um, uh, there was a closer relative than Boaz, because you'll find out later on that it's, Boaz has a little bit of an obstacle. We don't know. She could have known. And therefore, she encourages her to go to the threshing floor to go to Boaz's feet. Why? Because she is going to make the move. For some reason, Boaz did not make the move. So it led me to believe that he knew and Naomi knew. And they're going to make this happen. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is not some conniving thing. This is not some kind of planned out uh, situation where they're trying to circumvent the word of God. I believe this is what we, uh, we would call in the scripture the sovereignty of God and yet the will of mankind, the will of man. God does not impose his will on people, but he causes his will to be done through the people's individual choices. This is the amazing part about it. Now, there'll be some people who say, no, it's God's will and he forces people to do it. I said, well, 
That might be your opinion about things, but I don't see that in the scripture. There's always a choice. There's always a choice. Naomi had to go back to Israel. She had to go back to Bethlehem. Ruth had to choose to go back to, uh, to be under the shadow of the Almighty, to go back, under, uh, to go back with Naomi under, in Israel. There were choices that she made. Boaz chose to be kind to her. Now, God's grace influenced that? Absolutely. And God will influence those choices and will cause our choices to be made in a, in, in a certain way that he fills our hearts with grace and kindness and out of gratitude. We respond that way. That's what God wants, a response of love, a response of kindness. That's what God is not interested in good deeds of legalistic service. You know, I got to do this and I have to do this. God is looking for the mercy and the kindness within you that he has shown you. And therefore, he wants us to respond the same way toward him. You know, God wants a response of love toward him, but also to one another. And therefore, the, the, the greatest commandments, right? The greatest commandment, love the Lord. Go your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God. And love your neighbor as thyself. Why? God wasn't legislating a, a, a forced love. You better love me or else. He wants a response of love for him. And therefore, great things are promised to those who love him, right? To love him willfully. And uh, that is one thing I think that the, the, the Lord loves to uh, throw in the face of the devil and the enemy, that there are people, humans, who genuinely love God who genuinely love God, not out of a forced situation, but out of gratitude of what he's done for us. We truly love him because of who he is. And that's what God loves. He loves his people to love him and responds to his love and his mercy. He initiates it, but it's people responding. And so therefore you see the response. And, you know, why would God create people that were going to rebel anyway? Because God wants to redeem us. God wants to redeem us through Jesus. Even though he knew that we would rebel in the garden, God would send his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Despite our rebellion, despite our idolatry and immorality, he sent his son to rescue us. Even though he knew mankind would do it. Such is his love. He wants us back. And he wants us, like, like you, if your child went away from you, if he rebelled against you, had nothing to do with you, he would do anything to get him back, anything to get her back. So did God, even giving his own life for us. That's what he did. Now, tells her, go doll up. It's my translation. Doll yourself up. You're going to look like a bride. This is what she was doing. Wash, perfume, put in your best clothes like you're going to a wedding. We're going to have a wedding soon here. And on that day, that cute couple on my left that I'm not mentioning will be dolled up, and they will be good-looking that day. Good-looking all the time. But on that day, they would put on their best clothes, perfume, you know, wash behind the ear sort of thing, and that's what she did. Now, what she was doing is much more than just a hygiene thing. She had to look like a bride because she would have been wearing the clothes of a widow, somebody who had been mourning. Now, in, in that culture, you would have been mourning, uh, uh, you would have been wearing mourning clothes, not morning, like good morning, but something that you're mourning about, the death of a loved one, and you would wear perhaps something dark, perhaps something that would identify you as a widow. You're not looking for a husband. You're still mourning for your dead husband. So now, get rid of those clothes. You are going to look great. Now, this is not some, um, some sexual thing that she's going to go off or up herself, you know, with a tight minis miniskirt or anything like that. She was just relaying the fact that now throw off your widow clothes, your widow's clothes, and now you're going to look like a bride, that you're available for marriage. And she does. She follows exactly what Naomi does, what Naomi says. I'm sorry. Verse 5, and she said to her, Ruth to Naomi, all that you say, I will do. That's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing when you respond to the word of God that way. She has nothing. She has no food, very, very little food, very poor, no property, no husband, no relative. All she has is the word of God and the promise of God. It's a very important thing to remember. She's going in by faith and trusting Naomi and trusting the word of God 
and trusting the promises of God and says, I am going to put everything I have into these promises. I'm all in, we would say, in our vernacular. I'm all in. I'm all in with the Lord. I hope you're all in with the Lord too. I hope that despite of our affluence in America, hope of our things that we have, you count them as something that is a blessing, but not something you trust in. Our trust is still the Word of God. Our still trust is the promises of God. That's all we have. Every day it's the promises of God. Nothing is promised to us. Not even our life is promised to us tomorrow. All we have when we get up tomorrow is the promise of the Word of God. That's what you have. We all start the same way. So no matter what we have or what we don't have, it doesn't matter. All of us start the same. Tomorrow when we get up, we have the same promise. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And so she's going to go lay down at his feet. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz was eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lay down at the end of the heap of grain and she came secretly or softly, uncovered his feet, and she lay down. And this is what a winnowing threshing floor, this is what winnowing looked like on a threshing floor. These are actually uh, pictures of, of, of you know, modern day pictures of uh, people doing what uh, they were doing at the time, what Boaz was doing. So they would take the barley and they would scoop it and they would throw it up in the air and the, that breeze, that spring, remember this is, how long is barley season? Two weeks, right? Two weeks. And in a few weeks it's going to be wheat season. So they got to get this done pretty fast. And what they do with the barley, they throw it up and that nice spring breeze takes the chaff and blows it in one area and then the heavier grain, the grain that you eat, falls to the ground. So they scoop it up with a winnowing fan and the wind takes the chaff, and the grain falls to the ground. And by the end of the time, by the end of the day, they have this nice little heap, nice little pile of barley, and the chaff is taken and burnt in the fire. Now, that's interesting, right? Because that's exactly what Jesus said. That's exactly what John the Baptist said would happen in the end times, at the coming of Jesus. There would be a separation, wouldn't it? So what we see here is a, it's a picture of... And you start seeing the picture developed here. A picture of the kinsman redeemer, a picture of a Gentile woman coming to asking for mercy at the judgment time, where there's a separation of the wheat and the chaff, or the barley and the chaff, in this case, you would say. Uh, and she's finding herself, she finds herself at, at his feet. Now, you can make a lot of parallels, a lot of allusions to a time where Jesus said would come, Matthew 13, there would be a harvest. And that harvest would separate the chief of the chaff from the, the wheat, and they would be, the chaff would be thrown into the fire and burnt away. But the wheat will be taken into the storehouse, right? The, 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 the corn, the, 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 the kernel, the things that you eat, taken into the storehouse, the good stuff. She lays at his feet, and we don't know how long she laid at his feet, but she's told by Naomi to do this. Verse 7, she secretly uncovered his feet to lay down. And she was laying down there. We don't know how long. Could have been two hours. And you don't know exactly what she would have been thinking. <sighs> Is this going to work? <laughs> yeah, you got to think about it. It's like she has nothing. Boaz is there. And, and, and the, way they, you know, the way they would have done it at the time is they, they would have heaps, little hills, little mountains of, of, of barley and everybody had to sleep by their mountain of barley because, you know, robbers can come in and take it. So people slept by their food. And here's, you know, good old Boaz, you know, sleeping, and he's had, you know, something to eat, something to drink. He feels really good. He's not drunk, but he feels really good, and he's going to go lay down. After, you know, you've been there. You work hard that day, and there's nothing better after a long day of work to just lay down and sleep. And that's what he feels like. And he's, it's working, he's working hard, and he's going to go to sleep. And I don't know how long she was there, but all of a sudden, verse 8, it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled. Literally, the word is scared. He was scared, which lets you to know one thing. This is not an ordinary event. It's not like he's like, oh, yeah, I see, I see women like that all the time. You know, it's not that he wasn't that kind of guy. This literally scared him. Like, who in the world is this? And, um, and he bent forward, and behold, a woman was laying at his feet. He couldn't believe it. What in the world's going on? Now, by the way, just to clarify a few things, 
Uh, this idea of her laying at his feet has nothing to do with any sexual um, innuendos or any of that sort in terms of offering herself to, to, you know, for the night or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's a very symbolic gesture in the, in the ancient world, in the Middle East, in that culture, is to be willfully willing to submit to that man. Uh, it's a symbol of offering herself to him for his protection. She's poor, she's destitute, she has nothing, unable to help herself, and the only thing she has is to do exactly what Naomi says, and she's going to come right at his feet and just stay there until something happens. And isn't that amazing? By faith, she's doing this by faith. She has no, she, she doesn't know what's going to happen. The only thing she has is the promise of what Naomi told her. This is what the Word of God says. You do it, and let's see what God does. And this is very interesting because there's, there is always something of a difference between a command and a promise of God. In the Bible, there's both, aren't they? A command and promises. And we can't make promises happen. That's God's department, isn't it? God is the only one who can fulfill the promises. What are we accountable for? The commands of the Lord to do what he says. Now, sometimes we're so quick to make the promises of God happen and not, con and not concern ourselves with the commands of the Lord. But God wants us to obey him, and then the promises of God will, fulfill, will be fulfilled in his timing. And we'll, we'll see that at the end. So a few hours maybe pass by, and a woman's there, and this beautiful young woman, it's, it's laying at his feet and expressing a desire for him. Look what it says. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. So spread your covering. Uh, you also spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. You're a kin. You're a kinsman redeemer. Spread your garments, your corner of your garments, for you are a kinsman redeemer. And the book of Ezekiel, this is where we get the, uh, the, the point of what that means. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 8, we see a very clear picture of what that meant, that spreading the corner of, her, of his garments. Ezekiel 16, 8 tells us this. This is the Lord. And I passed by Israel, and I saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I, you were at the time for love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and enter into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declare, declares the Lord your God. He's talking about Israel and lamenting how Israel's gone away from him. And it's like the Lord saying, I went and I saw you and I put the, the, co the, the corner or the skirt of my cloak or my garment over you to cover you. And I made you mine. You became mine, declares the Lord. Uh, so this is a very symbolic thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East, in the Israel, that putting a covering over someone, you know, she says, she says to him, put your, the corner of your garment over me. It symbolizes that he is willing to cover her, protect her, provide for her. It's a very interesting thing. Don't try this at home, ladies. Uh, you know, if you're looking for a mate or anything like that, this is not exactly how it works today. Uh, but it is something that very much symbolizes something that we look for something today, is that the corner of the garment meant safety and protection. Are you willing to do this? Put your corner of your garment over me. Um, take me under your wing, we would say today. Uh, it's a privilege, but a responsibility. We don't have time tonight to get into it. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more today. But the word for... You know, this is a, a, a shawl, like a prayer shawl, like a covering, and uh, like a cloak. The word for the corner of a cloak, which she's talking about here, it's the same word for wing. Wing. Canap. Canap. Wing. Canafin. Wings. Corner. Canap. Cover me with your canap. Look at Ruth 2, verse 12. May the Lord reward your work. This is Boaz talking to Ruth. Be full, uh, may the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord God of Israel, under whose canap, you, or canafim, wings, you have come to seek refuge. 
He prays for her. I pray that you take refuge in the Lord. She comes to Boaz. Put your kanap over me. Remember I told you, I said, you better be sure that when you pray for someone, you mean it. Because <laughs> God will make you the agent to answer that prayer. Boaz prays, man, Ruth, you're great. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord, may you find refuge under the wings of the Lord. Refuge in his shelter. And she comes and says, okay, I'm finding my refuge. It's you. Boaz had better meant that prayer. You know, in the book of John, 1 John, we're told that, uh, you know, when you love someone, don't ever say, just be warm and be filled. We will say today, man, that's too bad. You need food, you need this. God bless you, bro, I'll pray for you. God would want you to provide that for them, wouldn't he? God would want you to be the mediator for that prayer to be answered. Man, I pray the Lord bless you, man. I pray the Lord provide food for you. And you go on, you know, to KFC or something like that. Or, I don't know, that would be me. Maybe I'm hungry tonight. You go on and you want to get a burger or something like that, and, and you don't even provide for him. You say, man, it would be nice to have a burger today. Man, I hope the Lord bless you with a burger today. Then you go on your way to have a burger. If you really meant that prayer, you probably would buy him a burger. You probably want to provide for that brother. That's what First John says. Don't just say be warm and be filled. That's not love. Here's Boaz says, man, I pray you find shelter under the Lord's wings, under his kanab. And then she comes and says, I'm going to take your kanab and I'm put it over me. Provide for me. She was, he was like the Lord to her, the answer to prayer. He was going to provide for her. And she was looking for that refuge. Did Boaz mean it? And he better mean it now. And I believe there was that already, that affection that was brewing in his heart. And he couldn't believe that this young woman was actually interested in him. Remember, Boaz is a lot older. In the book of Psalms, we see it all through the book of Psalms, but this, this idea that under his wings, Psalm 91, we will take shelter under the shadow of his wings. Kanaf, kenafim. All through, the New all through the Old Testament, I should say, we see this picture of the Lord represented by like a giant bird. And he covers and he hovers over his people and he watches over them. And we're called to take refuge. Psalm 18, Psalm 70, I believe it's Psalm 30, uh, 73, Psalm 91, probably the most famous one. Under the shelter of your wings, kanafim. In the book of Malachi, maybe we'll read that next, next week. In the book of Malachi, we're told that the Lord, the Son of Righteousness, will appear. That's a very famous passage. Anybody know how to fi uh, finish that verse? The Son of Righteousness, to you who fear the Lord, the Son of Righteousness will appear with healing in his wings, right? Malachi 4, is a prophecy about Jesus. And that's the word for cloak, right? That's the word for the corner of your cloak too. So when the woman came to Jesus and she touched the garment of his cloak, she was looking for that refuge. Remember that? The kanafim, it was the, the outer edge of his garment. She was actually in an Old Testament way coming under the refuge of the Almighty, under the shadow of the Almighty. She was looking for Jesus. She knew that he was the only one that can provide that healing. Malachi 4.2 says the son of righteousness will arise and will bring healing in his wings. Kanafim, the, the wings, yeah. But they're also the outer garments of your cloak. And that's what people were reaching out for Jesus for, for healings. Amazing. It comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Ruth. Now, we're just about finished because we're not going to get through the end. I'm going to have to leave you in suspense. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I'm sorry, verse 10. Then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first, but not going after men, after young men, whether rich or poor. But now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for whatever you ask of all my people in the city. Know that you are a woman of excellence. A woman of virtue, another translation said. It is the same word that appears in the book of Proverbs, verse 10. A woman of excellence, a woman of 
virtue. Fascinating. There's something about the character of Ruth. She was a woman of excellence. She was a Proverbs 31 woman. Which all ladies, ladies, you strive to be a Proverbs 31 woman, right? Amen. Amen. Only one. I guess it's a tall order, right? Men are to be kind. Men are to be like the Lord. Amen, right? <laughs> Love their wives. Ladies are to be an excellent woman, a woman of virtue. We're probably done with this. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with virtue because otherwise it'll go on for a while. Man, this is the temptation. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. Uh, virtue. As one person said, you can't fake virtue for a long time. You can't fake a good character for a long time. It's like a marathon. Has anyone here ran long distance cross country here before? Has anyone participated? Okay. You have to train to cover a certain amount of miles. And the coach, whoever your coach is, they don't really have to like watch you during your practice to know if you've actually been training. Because on the day of the race, mm -hmm. it'll show. First few miles, man, even I can fake it. Mm -hmm. But you go after a while, that race is going to get really hard. And it'll be evident to all that I was at Chuck E. Cheese instead <laughs> at the training center running. It'll be clear. It's the same with virtue and character. You can't fake it for a long time. You can fake it for a few Sundays, but watch people over the course of their term, over their course of a year. You'll get a picture of what their virtues are, their moral excellence, their character. Anybody can fake it for a few miles, but if you haven't been training, it'll be evident by the fifth mile that you have not trained. And the same with virtue. You can't fake it too long. It has to come from a relationship with Christ. It has to come from an abiding relationship with Christ. Not a legalistic, religious relationship with Christ, but an abiding, loving relationship with Christ, where you are, his character is being poured out in your life by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, we would say, will be evident in your life. Your character will be evident to all who wants to see it, that this man or this woman has been with Jesus. It'll be clear. It's clear to Boaz, you are a woman of excellence. You're a widow, and, and, and you could have gone for every, anything. You can even have to come to Israel. You come into a, a strange land, a strange people following your mother-in-law, and you're abiding under the word of God, and you're working hard, and, and you didn't go up to these men. You know, it doesn't, never talks about Ruth's outer beauty, but it's always talking about Ruth's inner beauty, right? Which the Bible says, that doesn't fade. <laughs> the outside always fades, <laughs> you know? You see these models, these, you know, superstars that, you know, they, they have to constantly upgrade their, their outside. Why? Because they're corrupt on the inside. They're morally hollow on the inside. God's people, you know, if you're blessed with good looks, man, I pray for you because it's harder. <laughs> See, even an ugly guy like me, he just need to have to just pray for me a little bit. But the outside corrupts. The outside decays. It, 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 it just dies out. You don't look like you were 18 or 20 or 25. It just eventually changes. But the inner man, that moral excellence, that virtue, who can find a woman like that, Proverbs says? Who can find one? None of the husbands says, I married one. Oh my, we have to pray. And we have to shut down the study. Serge is going to come for counseling next week. <laughs> but we need to pray for our wives, for our sisters, for our mothers, for the ladies in this fellowship, that the Lord would increase in them a virtue, a moral excellence that will be evident. He says, you're an excellent woman. 
And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. And now it's true. I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Dun, 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 dun. And you're looking for the story, and you go, man, it was just getting good. You mean he's not? Oh. Next week, I'll show you some of the intricate things. Whoever wrote the story, which most Jewish scholars and even ancient scholars said of Samuel at the time of the judges. Um, he, it's fascinating. The, the intricate details of, we'll, we'll look at it next week, we don't have time tonight, of how it's set up, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and they're all tied in together and they all have similar interactions and they all have similar climaxes. It's very fascinating. It had to be the work of the Spirit through the writer to explain these things and how it came out. And um, there's a closer relative, remain in the night, and, my, and, and when the morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord, God, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Don't worry about it. I promise that if this relative that's closer can do it, you'll be redeemed. If he doesn't do it, I'll redeem it. And there's somebody that's closer to Naomi than he is. And we'll see it next week, how it plays out, because you see, you start seeing the picture of Jesus in this kinsman redeemer, one like us who can only redeem us. He's the only one who can. And yet, there's an issue. There's something of an obstacle. Something has to be fulfilled in order for us to be redeemed by our kinsman redeemer. There's someone that's closer to us, somebody that has to be dealt with before we can be redeemed by Jesus. We'll talk about that next week. But he's willing to do it. But he's willing to not to circumvent. Did you see that? He's willing. He doesn't just give her a kiss and say, you know, you love me and I love you and forget that guy. We're just going to elope and go together. No, he says, you know what? Let's do this right. Let's do this according to the Lord. And I'm confident the Lord's going to do it. If he doesn't do it, then I'm going to do it. And, you know, if that man doesn't want to do it, I'll do it. But the Lord is with us. As the Lord lives, I will do it. There's a guy that has a lot of character, too. A lot of wonderful. He, he's just a, a wonderful man of the Lord. He's a picture of Christ, of course, who was willing to go through the extent of the law, to live under the law, to live under the, the, the commitments to the law, before he could redeem us, he lived under that law. And what the Apostle Paul said, that Jesus came, born of a woman, under the law to redeem us from the law. He came to do that. But he didn't violate the law. You see, Jesus could have come and said, hey, you know, forget it, the law's going to go away anyway. I'm here. Who cares? You just follow me. No, he kept the law of God. He fulfilled it. He was the embodiment of the law. Never went against it. And he still redeemed us. It's a picture of Christ in this picture. It's Boaz. And next week, we see that he gives her a gift, sends her home. And there's a beautiful picture where he gives her the gift, and, and Naomi gets it. <laughs> Ruth is probably going, like, what is going on here? And he says, my daughter, just wait. He's going to do it. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this wonderful book. Lord, it's amazing that you would care about a family, a widow, a young widow in Bethlehem. Lord, so much reminds me of your birth, that you came to a family in Bethlehem. Lord, how beautiful this book is. And it gives us that picture. It gives us the hope that, Lord, that we are to trust in you, rely on you, even in difficult times, Lord. We are to rely on your promises. And we know, Lord, today that you are working in our lives. We may not see it. It may be slow. But, Lord, you're preparing things. You are arranging things. The things unseen and very slow things seem to happen, but, Lord, you're working. And, Lord, we want to totally trust you tonight. We want to totally put ourselves at your feet. And, Lord, what circumstances surround us, what difficulties may face, we honor you today as the Lord of our lives. And, Lord, and we want to stand in your promises. We want to trust them, Lord. We want to... Uh, Lord, bind them on, uh, on our necks and in our hearts 
and allow you, Lord, to fulfill those promises. Teach us more, Lord, about abiding in you, trusting in you, obeying you, and relying on you, Lord. Even it may be hard at times to wait. Lord, this is a time that we are to grow an opportunity to see your hand of provision working in our lives. Lord, I know there are many prayers in this room. There's many longings in this room in the heart of prayers and, and prayers that can even be uttered sometimes because they're so intimate. We don't even know how to word them. Please, Lord, answer them in your timing and in your will. Give them, Lord, the desire of their heart. If you put that in there, Lord, give that to them, Lord. But they would be patient and they would wait on you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.